My, uh, my name is Sean McMaster. I am a consultant with uh, HNTB. I'm um, very pleased to be with you today uh, and have such an esteemed group here up on our, on our panel. I will be moderating the discussion, um, and we have about an hour and 15 minutes. We have, obviously, live participation, so please um, write down your good questions, and, and we will have a segment of time um, midway towards the end where we'll be able to uh, field live questions. We also have folks online, so that's fantastic, and they will have the opportunity as well if you're listening in to um, ask questions of our panelists. Um, I'd just like to start by saying um, this is a fantastic opportunity. I want to thank the governor uh, and Secretary Lorenz and, and the Infrastructure Hub for this opportunity for this infrastructure summit to talk to you about such an important um, historic chance and opportunity that we have here in this country. Um, to, to realize some of these unmet transportation needs from a funding perspective that, uh, that we've been dealing with as a society um, over the years. And the governor pointed out, you know, many of these challenges with bridges and congestion, and I think um, some of these programs that we have at the United States Department of Transportation are, are well positioned to help support a multitude of different needs, and of course we hope to hear from you about um, what those may be. And um, The purpose of this panel today is really, really threefold. Uh, and the secretary pointed this out, but we want to make sure we hit on the opportunities of this bill, um, what the challenges may be that we're facing outside uh, of this room here, and then what are some actions that we might be able to identify that we can take to help um, support communities uh, and the state of Kansas as it looks to um, prioritize and identify projects and federal funding opportunities to help support those projects. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Florence Chen. She is our representative from the United States Department of Transportation. She had an awesome presentation this morning. Hopefully you were all able to, to hear that, but I would ask her to maybe repeat a little bit of some of the discussion that we have around uh, some of the transportation opportunities. So Florence. Um, it is, uh, let me turn over the, the mic to you. This is uh, for some opening comments. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks again. Thanks so much to Secretary Lawrence, your whole team, for having me here. Um, it's good to be here with many of my colleagues at the Federal Highway Administration. Um, we have Rick in the front row here, our uh, Federal Highway Division Administrator, and then many of our other colleagues on the line virtually who really exemplify the, uh, the partnership and collaboration expertise that we hope to offer at the Department of Transportation. So what I do is I work on implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law at the Department of Transportation. Through that law, we received $660 billion over five years, including over $270 billion in new and increased funding for uh, transportation projects nationwide. We're standing up 40 new programs and changing many of our legacy programs as well. Um, so I wanted to be here today to talk about how the money and the infrastructure law can help to improve and transform transportation systems in your cities, towns, and counties. Specifically, the infrastructure law contains a lot of discretionary grant funding, so I wanted to do an outline of how discretionary grant funding works, follow up a bit more on the first question from this morning, talk about what specific grant programs can be a really good fit for Kansas, and then how you can access this money. And then I really want your question and your feedback because like I said this morning I know a little bit about the bipartisan infrastructure law I don't know as much about Kansas transportation as any one of you and I'm really here to learn about that so we can make this law work for you um, so first how discretionary grant funding works discretionary grants are pools of money that states and local governments access through a competitive application process starts with what we USDOT put out what's called a notice of funding opportunity or NOFO that describes the purpose of the grant how to apply the criteria we use to select winners so as a local government with a transportation project in mind, you first look at whether you're eligible, um, and then you submit an application for the deadline, which is usually 60 or 90 days. We then take a few months to review all the applications, identify those that best meet the criteria, announce awards, and put contracts in place to issue the money. And if you get the grant, you need to meet federal requirements on reporting on and using that grant money. We know those requirements might be new to you, which is why are the Kansas Local Technical Assistance Program, Kansas Division Office, KDOT are collaborating on running trainings to familiarize local governments with federal funding and grant requirements. We really encourage you to apply to, or sorry, to attend those. You do not need to apply to those. Just go attend those. Apologies. Um, so at USDOT, we recognized applying for funding without knowing whether you're going to receive it. We know that's a lot of work. We know that's especially true for smaller counties and towns. And we know that federal requirements for money can be different from and more complicated than state money. But we really, really want you to apply for a couple reasons. Um, first is that discretionary grants make up over $200 billion of the money of the infrastructure law, or $40 billion a year. It's a lot of money available to go directly to your projects if DOT selects you for an award. And second, a lot of those programs are 
are specifically designed and tailored to meet the needs of local governments. So that brings me to grant programs that could be a good fit for Kansas. I know I walked you through like 12 of them this morning, um, and I know that if you go on, you know, build.gov or the Bill Guidebook or DOT Navigator, you see like hundreds, and it's very overwhelming. I recognize that. And so what I want to do is be really specific and highlight three programs where you can start. Um, so first, bridge investment program. Um, we know that Kansas has more bridges per capita than anywhere in the country, and that so many of these bridges, especially the county bridges, need repairs and need investment. So that's why we have a program that makes $2.36 billion available 2022 on a competitive application basis for bridges. Local government's very much eligible to apply. Emphasize that bridges that cost less than $100 million compete in a different category than larger bridges over $100 million. So you're not going to be competing against the billion-dollar bridges. Um, if you're applying for a bridge that costs less than $100 million, you have until September 8th to apply. So that's open right now. Go take a look at that. Second, a Safe Streets and Roads for All program. This program is only for local governments. States can't apply. Um, we're offering $1 billion in 2022 to develop action plans for transportation projects that reduce deaths and serious injuries on roads and to build these projects. And through this program, what we hope to do is really partner with your governments over the long term to first fund the process of doing research and analysis, community outreach, create a plan for roadway safety, and then make that plan a reality. I know that KDOT's also encouraging you to apply, making matching funds available especially for the safety action plans. Again, applications are open. They close on September 15th. Third one I want to highlight, Railroad Crossing Elimination Program, $573 million in FY22 to make railroad crossing safer for people and vehicles. A couple notes on this one. First is the purpose of this program is really in the name. It's to eliminate highway railway and pathway railway grade crossings that are blocked by trains. And so a project that makes crossing safer can be a really good application, but a project that actually just stops the trains from blocking the crossing entirely can be a really good application. Um, second, 20% set aside for rural and tribal communities. So really encouraging rural local governments as well as all local governments apply to this one by October 4th. You can find other grants as well as this one on our uh, DOT Navigator website, which is our one-stop shop for learning about DOT programs, but these are the three you can start with. A uh, third point I want to make here is what you're probably thinking right now is, okay, Florence, if you go around telling everybody to apply, you'll get hundreds of applications. My application is never going to be the one that makes it out of the pile. Um, so I want to take the last couple of minutes to address that. We do expect more applications coming that we can fund. That's true. Definitely, because the need for transportation investment in our country is just so big after decades of underinvestment. Uh, but I do want to talk a bit more about three ways you make your application stand out. Uh, first one here is workforce. I know we're going to talk more about this in Q&A. We already have. Uh, we have a lot of construction projects that need workers, and both public and private entities are having trouble finding those workers. Good news here is the infrastructure law is meant to fund projects over the next decades, not just this year. That's why investing in the workforce of the future is so critical. And what that means for you is this. Think about how you can partner with the state, with community colleges, with high schools, with unions, with employers to create workforce development and apprenticeship programs as part of your project. If you're using these to train people to work on your project, highlight that on your application. That will help to see how you to see how oh sorry, that will help us to see how you're helping to achieve the broader goal of the administration, which is creating good jobs and expanding workforce capacity. Uh, second, talk about how your projects are going to be resilient to extreme weather and natural disasters. Again, we're building for the next decades here. And as we've all seen over the last 20 years, there's more droughts and hurricanes and floods and storms that are doing more severe damage to our homes and businesses than ever before. So as USDOT, we really want to see in your applications that the projects that you're proposing are going to last, that you've used materials and designs to protect your systems from extreme weather. Third, if your project is in an underserved community, make that clear in your application. What I want to emphasize here is that when we say underserved community, we're not just talking about low-income neighborhoods and cities. We're really not. We're talking more broadly about communities that have struggled over years or decades to get the resources to meet their transportation needs. Some of that's in cities. Some of that's also in rural communities. We want to expand access to resources through the infrastructure law. So we want you to tell us in your application about how the current system is not meeting the needs of your community and how those needs have changed of the years, how the funding has not kept up, and what you want to have in order to change that. And so to wrap up for me, please apply for discretionary grants, look at the Bridge Investment Program, look at Safe Streets for All, look at the Railroad Crossing Elimination Program in particular, highlight workforce development, resilience, and unmet needs in your application. We want to make it easier for you, partner with you, we need your feedback and your participation to make that happen. So I'm very happy to take your questions, and thanks so much.
appreciate it. That's a great intro there. And we're going to now turn to Mike Moriarty with uh, Kansas DOT. He's going to give us uh, the Kansas perspective. So, Mike. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> I'm going to take the podium, and I don't want to hunch over and speak through the table, Mike. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Moyarty. I'm with the Kansas DOT, and I'm our Chief of Transportation Planning. Happy to be here today alongside my colleagues Matt, Amanda, and Florence. So I, hope, uh, I hope they feel the same. So I've been in the industry since about 2000 or 2001, and uh, during my career I've been a part of several federal transportation bills, and I think each one of those programs, those federal programs, was special in its own way. Each brought something new forward with its passage. Uh, for example, T21 created the seven planning factors for regional transportation planning. Uh, Safety Lou brought about several new multimodal programs. And under MAP21, a stronger emphasis was placed on expedited project delivery. But none of the federal programs I've been around ever felt like a game changer. They never felt like ICE-T, for example, which was passed back in 1991. ICE-T, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Equity Act, was hailed as landmark legislation. It emphasized multimodal transportation and multimodal connections, and not just simply highway travel. And then fast forward, right, just last year, the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed, and it felt different. It felt different to me, right? It felt transformational. It's what I imagine people felt like when ICE-T became law back in 1991. And like ICE-T, Bill is landmark keystone legislation. And here at KDOT, we recognize that. And we're answering Bill's call to action in many ways. Earlier this year, uh, we hosted several Bill meetings across Kansas. I know some of you were able to attend those meetings. And one thing we talked about was the additional funding coming to KDOT under Bill. And I'm using round numbers here, so please bear with me. But it's about $145 million per year. In, formula, in additional formula dollars coming to Kansas. And roughly 55 of that will be assigned to additional bridge work, our transportation electrification efforts, rural public transit, and carbon reduction program efforts as well. And the other 90 million per, per year will be directed towards additional highway spending. So what does this additional highway funding let us do? I think most importantly, it helps us maintain our programming commitments statewide, in particular, our bridge replacements and our surface preservation work. It also gives KDOT additional flexibility to program more dollars in several key areas. For example, our City Connecting Link Improvement Program. Todd, you proudly purvey that program, right? One of our most popular programs. Because of Bill, we could be able to program an additional five to 10 million per year in that program. Our portfolio of safety programs could potentially see an extra $7 million per year. Our modernization and expansion projects, right, our large capital projects, could see an additional 40 to $60 million per, per year. Probably more so on the, moder the modernization side than the expansion side, but point is, our capital projects could see a significant cash infusion. Our cost share program. If Michelle was in here, Todd, I would tell her that that's our most popular program. But the cost share program, very popular, could see additional funding as well. Our active transportation programs as well are being considered for additional funding. And again, I want to emphasize the 145 that we're talking about here is on the formula side. Don't forget, as Florence pointed out, 40% of the funding under Bill is in discretionary programs. Things like infra, the passenger rail partnership program, the bridge investment program, and the emergent and exciting program, Safe Streets for All, as well as RAISE. And we're a little excited about RAISE. Right now, Florence, we submitted our first application to that just this year for the Centennial Bridge. So if you can help us out with that. I can't talk to you about that. I'm very sorry. I forgot you mentioned that earlier. And KDOT wants us all to be successful with our grant applications, right? And when it's possible, we want to help provide information and tools, again, to help everybody be successful. I'll use Todd again as an example. The Bureau of Local Projects, they're working on a county transportation infrastructure planning tool. It's going to help our county partners understand where and how to target the infrastructure investments. And I think that's important when you consider 80% of the system in Kansas is under county jurisdiction in terms of roadways, and 70% of our bridges are the responsibility of our counties. 
Our Bureau of Transportation Safety, we've been talking about this a lot. I feel like I'm being a bit re redundant here, but they are gonna roll out a uh, pilot match program for safe streets for all action plans. Uh, again, the, this funding supports regional, local, and tribal initiatives through grants to prevent roadway deaths and serious injuries. The money is available for planning and projects. Right now, the focus is on planning, and the pilot is focused on planning efforts because the plans are a precursor to construction projects. Bottom line, we want as many plans out there as possible to support safety for all users in an equitable manner. And speaking of equity, remember Bill is not just about funding. Like I said earlier, this is keystone legislation. And I think we're all gonna be doing things a bit differently in the transportation space going forward. Overall, we're gonna be better, we're gonna be cleaner, we're gonna be more inclusive and equitable. We'll have opportunities to work together and address things like, uh, like barriers within our respective areas. I'm thinking of the Reconnecting Communities pilot program. And lastly, I think Bill is gonna make mobility safer for everyone. I'm thinking about the Safe Streets for All program. Again, we have additional dollars to program in our, our safety programs. I'm also thinking about railroad crossings as well. Uh, for the past several months, we've been reviewing our business processes relative to the prioritization of crossing improvement projects. And I'm not talking about just lights and gates here. I'm talking about grade separations. I'm talking about closures. And we're also talking about mitigating the disproportionate impacts from block crossings in, in, in disadvantaged areas across Kansas. And how can we partner with EMS to improve the routing and response time of first responders in communities with busy railways that frequently suffer block crossings? And we'll be engaging big data to help us inform these investment decisions and again, focus and improve life safety. Briefly before I step down, I wanna just point out we do have some subject matter experts here today from KDOT. Uh, we'll be calling on them throughout today's, uh, two days proceedings so they can amplify or perhaps carry the, the conversation. So once again, it's a pleasure to be here today. I look forward to being part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, really appreciate it. Great words of, uh, of encouragement, optimism related to uh, what we're looking at here. Um, our next speaker is Amanda Grer with the Mid-America Regional Council. Amanda, if you'd, uh, if you'd like to provide some opening comments, uh, we appreciate it, thank you. Not quite as tall as Mike, so I have no problem sitting at the table and hunching over my table mic. Um, my name is Amanda Grayer. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at the Mid-America Regional Council. We are the MPO and Council of Governments for the Bi-State Kansas City Metropolitan Area. Um, so I am representing not just the Kansas side of the Kansas City Metro, but also the Missouri side, and some of my comments will reflect that bi-state nature as well. Um, I'm also not representing any specific agency and not part of, you know, the state agency conglomeration, so I am definitely a local government stakeholder role up on this panel today. And some of the things that we were asked to consider in our opening remarks were basically what can the state do, what can the federal government do to reduce barriers and to make local projects more um, uh, easier to implement, but also more meaningful to implement at the at the local level. And so, um, you know, in chatting with my colleagues at Mark before I came out here to kind of answer some of these questions, a lot of what we talked about were uh, the the types of investments that have the highest value from this work. And a lot of them are planning, which sounds, uh, you know, we are a planning organization. Of course, I'm going to say planning is really important. But a lot of the stuff that we have going on really requires a harder look to make sure that it it falls under all of the guidance that this competitive funding in particular is coming from. We want to make sure that the projects that we're doing are addressing the workforce issues, are addressing the environmental issues, are addressing the equity issues that come up and are not always as fully addressed in plans that are meant to be for future funding and future looking in some way. We want to make sure that all of the projects that get implemented under this legislation that is truly having five years of funding as opposed to three or even one year of funding is a really big deal for our local governments. And so we want to make sure that we're making the most of it now. So planning is going to be important. Also implementation and honestly operating support. We get a, for, for those shared mobility modes, um, I've spent two days this week with uh, Federal Highway, did a peer exchange with MPOs all over the country on shared mobility and equity and how we can increase shared mobility and thereby increase equity in our transportation system. 
And a lot of that comes down to subsidizing and operating costs. And we have certain types of funding through FTA that can pay for you know, three years of a new route or the, the existing things like that. But operating costs tend to come down to we've got infrastructure money, we can build bus stops, we can buy buses, we can do all this stuff. How do we keep the service running so when people start relying on it, it's not gone in three years? And so we're looking at not just that planning and infrastructure dollars, but also the ongoing operating costs. Five years is a long time, but in the grand scheme of a person's life, it's not. So if we do these projects and then in five years they don't exist anymore, that's a, that's a problem. And so those types of investments have some of the highest value. Also, the multi-jurisdictional, sort of this systems and corridors approach to things. I'm sure it happens in other places too, but certainly in Kansas City, people can live in one jurisdiction, work in another, their kids go to school in a third, and in our case, sometimes it's in a different state, not just in a different county or a different city. And so that multi-jurisdictional planning, when we started working on autonomous vehicle policy framework back in 2017, one of the sort of goals that we had was that someone could drive from Liberty, Missouri to Olathe, Kansas, and have a seamless experience. It crosses multiple county boundaries, multiple city boundaries, and a state boundary. How do we make sure that when we're implementing technology and we're implementing priorities, that it is as seamless as possible to access transportation opportunities across jurisdictional boundaries for a regional economy? I know our city councils and our county commissions, they have geographic responsibility, but as soon as we cross those county boundaries, if we have a mismatched framework and a patchwork of policies and implementation, it makes it really, really hard from a resident standpoint to access opportunity. And when I say access opportunity, transportation is not, transportation's a means to an end, right? People don't drive around all day and that is their goal on how to spend their day. They're getting to work, they're getting to school, they're getting to healthcare, they're getting to educational opportunities, and they're getting to leisure opportunities. And so we have to make sure that the system works to get to all of those things, and not just for commuters on Monday through Friday, eight to five, that it really meets the needs of our residents and our transportation system. Some of the barriers at the local level that we run into, it's already been mentioned several times, but we're, we have real concerns about the workforce. If we get a bunch of money in to do these projects, they can't all be implemented at the same time. How do we phase them and perhaps phase them into some, you know, front load some planning stuff and front load some infrastructure projects so we're not trying to do all of the infrastructure projects in year two, three, and four, and all of the planning projects in year one. You know, making sure that we're doing this in a way that makes sense for our local workforce while also providing training opportunities to get more people into that local workforce pipeline. One of the things that we do, Mark is also the Council of Governments, we do a lot of things outside of transportation planning. So we have our area agency on aging, we do early learning and Head Start, we do workforce services, we coordinate the regional 911 system, emergency management planning, dispatcher training, I mean, there's a lot going on at Mark outside of our transportation work. So how do we, so we do these things called town to industry exchanges where it helps us figure out what the workforce pipelines are through our economic research group. We did one for the public sector and learned there was a, I think it was a 2018 report and it said that 57% of high school students are not exposed to skilled trades in high school. How do we change that pipeline to help folks understand that skilled trades are an incredibly important part of the economy? Those jobs are no less legitimate than something that requires a four-year degree or an advanced degree and expose them to those types of things earlier rather than hoping they have a family member who did something like that and that's how they know that construction is a great job or that's how they know that public sector, public works departments are great jobs too. Um, I mentioned the bi-state thing too. This whole conversation is also going on in the state of Missouri with a completely separate set of stakeholders and our population is split pretty evenly on either side of the state line. So we have to make sure that what we're doing, you know, we are the regional planning organization. We don't really do things on behalf of a single jurisdiction in our region. We make sure that we're coming together and doing that multi-jurisdictional coordination. And if the opportunities involve Cass County and Miami County, they border each other. It's only state line road that separates them. So there's a lot of similarities and priority there. So how do we make sure that we can take advantage of the federal opportunities and bring both states into the conversation in a meaningful way to have those projects best serve the residents of counties that are really demographically very similar to each other but just happen to be in two different states. Um, I will mention the <laughs> flexibility and matching funds is gonna be real big for us. Um, there's been some years where, you know, cash match only, no in-kind, no, you know, those kinds of policies are gonna be really difficult to move all of these types of projects forward. There's just not enough local cash to match all of the potential opportunities and I would hate for that to be the limiting factor on a, on a city or a county being able to do a project is they just can't come up with enough cash in that moment. 
Um, and then finally, what I would ask for the hub, uh, what I would ask of this hub is just to help connect collaboration opportunities. So if someone comes to any of us in this room and says, I really want to work on this, but I don't know who else is interested in working on it, I think that's a big purpose of this hub structure is to be, you know, I work also on broadband. I could have been in like probably five of the different rooms today interested in and working on all of these opportunities. Transportation is not disconnected from water and sewer. Transportation is not disconnected from broadband. Transportation is not disconnected connected from energy and power. So how do we make sure that folks that are not just interested in, or that are interested in transportation are also seeing the federal opportunities from Department of Energy or Department of Interior or you know, EPA and making the most of the federal opportunities, not just US, USDOT opportunities? Um, I'm sure there will be more questions as we go forward, but I'm thankful to be here and happy to take questions later. Thanks, Amanda, really appreciate it. That was a really great explanation transportation to our society, but also the interconnectivity with um, other aspects that you wouldn't necessarily think are directly related to transportation. Hopefully we can get into more of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, right now I want to introduce Matt Allen uh, with the City of Garden City. Uh, save the best for last, Matt. Go ahead, please. Uh, it'll provide some opening comment. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. There must be somebody talking after me then. Um, Lord, who cranked that thing down? <clears throat> uh, I would like to echo the, the comments thanking uh, the governor and the secretary for convening this group. I believe it's important. Um, I have no answers today. I think I'm here representing uh, questions and, and maybe thinking out loud. So I would encourage you, those of you that are in city and county government, um, if there's some things that I miss about questions and concerns, the identification of challenges or opportunities, uh, please speak up and share share those with, with us and with the group. Uh, I look at this list of transportation projects, I see highway, I see rail. Just within rail, there's passenger rail, there's freight rail um, for major track owners, there's short line rail, uh, airports, fixed route transit, call ahead transit, bike pet opportunities, electric vehicle charging stations. In the city of Garden City, we could uh, pursue a, a grant opportunity, multiple grant opportunities in any one of those categories. That in and of itself is overwhelming. The capacity for us to do that is uh, by ourselves is impossible. Uh, and uh, you know, one way uh, that we need this uh, infrastructure hub is just to help us sort through that, help us look for opportunities where w maybe we don't have to play point guard on a project, but uh, we can play a supporting role uh, in, in somebody else's. Um, I'm just going to kind of take this from the context of roads because I think that may overlap with the most, uh, most of this group, at least my comments, and then uh, through questions and answers I can maybe address some of the other categories. Uh, our community is in need of on-system and off-system road improvements, and uh, in order to do that, we need a flexible KDOT uh, that can be our partner through existing cost share programs and the competitive programs, as well as continuing to be our key economic development partner at the state level. Uh, and we've got a, a you know, 15 to 20 year history of, uh, of a lot of evidence where we've been able to turn 10x the investment that KDOT has uh, placed in our community. Uh, from an economic standpoint. Uh, some big challenges though, you know, right now there's water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink it seems like for several of us and uh, we're in seek of answers. There is risk in all of that of diverting our attention away as, uh, as local leaders from our priority issues uh, uh, for the temptation and maybe sometimes the pressure from uh, governing bodies or for governing bodies the pressure from community members uh, to go access some of these do dollars whether or not they align with your community priorities. Uh, the, I see a really real challenge and a question uh, uh, earlier to, to Florence which I, I think she gave a thoughtful workforce answer to but uh, uh, you know right right now the entire country is lining up to hire either in-house engineers or planners or consulting engineers and planners to go after uh, some of the prerequisite uh, prerequisite studies to, to access some of these dollars and 
that's going to be a log jam, which is later going to turn into a log jam on materials and a log jam on uh, design professionals for the projects and then a log jam for contractors to actually execute the projects and to think that that's all going to get done for $1.2 billion worth of projects in, uh, in, in half a decade seems uh, uh, seems a little unrealistic. I mean, I, but I'm thankful for the dollars, but I'm a little bit concerned that 2026 dollars, 1.2 million is going to be the equivalent of three or four hundred thousand dollars in or I'm sorry, 1.2 billion is going to be the equivalent of three or 400 million in 2021 dollars. Uh, but what are the opportunities? Um, we, cities, counties, the state of Kansas, design professionals, contractors, private sector partners have a chance to change the way we look at transportation funding. Uh, we have a chance to change the way we look at project planning and the execution of those projects. Our collective approach, I'm not putting this on KDOT, this is our collective approach and how we've handled the KDOT six district system as we've created six mini states. So we're not only at a disadvantage that we're a rural state, we've subdivided ourselves into six smaller states. Uh, competition between the districts for funding and then once the funding gets to the districts there's competition within that for the funding as well so as a result we have the transportation system we have which is not really a network of corridors that logically take advantage of where uh, the economic hubs in all uh, corners of our state are present or the development potential unrealized development potential of some other portions of our state. This is generational opportunity, uh, generational money, as Mike pointed out, uh, where we can unlock that thinking and uh, begin to think of things regionally. We've got a break from the parochial way of looking at, at funding and develop partnerships. So, you know, right now, what, there's 500 people uh, at, this, at this conference. Let's say there's two people, three people from every community that attended. Uh, with 600 cities alone in, in the state of Kansas, that means there's uh, quite a few people that aren't here, quite a few cities that aren't represented here. There's probably quite a few counties that aren't represented here. Uh, go find those people and bring them here. Don't look at this as, hey, man, this is 500 people that have a jump start on the funding. Uh, go find those. Uh, go find those neighbors. In Garden City, um, we do a lot of work with our, our friends in Dodge City 50 miles away. Uh, we need to be thinking about the city of Cimarron that sits between us. Uh, we need to be thinking about the city of Holcomb and the city of Deerfield, uh, the city of Lakin and the city of Syracuse and the city of Kendall uh, that are between Garden City and the state line and begin looking at these things as a corridor. North and south, uh, in a state that has no four lanes from the Colorado border to the Nebraska border and certainly no four lane presence in the western half of the state, who are the partners that we can identify uh, to begin having those conversations about what long-term regional transportation planning might look like. Uh, so I welcome your comments. I encourage you to, uh, yeah, kind of unlock traditional thinking. Uh, the secretary mentioned that this morning. If you came here looking for dollars, uh, they aren't going uh, to be, they aren't going to be handed out today. Uh, what is here is future partners in your application. So take advantage of the next 24 hours and, and find some partners. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. You ended on such a great note because that's, I think, one of the first points of conversation I think will be really helpful for folks out there um, to understand. The, the scope of the bill is in such a way, and there's so much of an effort within this current administration to put money in local hands and not not primarily rely just on the state uh, to, to distribute these funds. That I'd like to I'd like to turn it over uh, to maybe each one of our one of our panels to talk a little bit about partnerships and the importance of coordination and and uh, the opportunity that that provides as it relates to these um, many of these programs that uh, the U.S. Department of Tra Department of Transportation is going to be administering over the coming years. Um, Florence, I don't know if we you could start with uh, um, how important. Um, you see partnerships and coordination when it comes to to applying for these dollars and then and then hopefully being successful and, and receiving an award. 
think. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. And I, I'd like to address, let's say, three aspects of that. First is building on what you just said um, about national transportation systems, right? So as we've been talking about here, there's two types of funding. There's formula funding, which is mostly goes through the state. Um, so you can blame him for that one. I'm just kidding. Um, and... <laughs> And then there is are the 40% discretionary grants, which um, you apply to the federal government for money. So what neither of those is, is a national or a regional or a local plan for, you know, what do we really need to build at a system level, at a network level, at a corridor level? We at the federal government don't have a specific mandate from Congress to do that. We are either supposed to give it to the state or we are supposed to use an individual rubric, an individual grant program to give you the money. But what we want to be doing is we want to be thinking more collaboratively with states, with cities, with counties, with towns about how do you really build that national network. And to do that, we need your expertise and your collaboration to tell to do the planning together on the state level, the local level, the regional level, and to tell us what those networks look like and why they matter. So I think when you're thinking about your funding applications, really encourage you to work amongst yourselves to demonstrate that network of projects because then that will give us the opportunity to go and fund that. Um, so that's the first piece. I think the second piece is we want to think about partnership beyond just the government level, right? So to give you one example, um, there is a Thriving Communities Program, $25 million program that just came out on June 30th. So what that is is actually reaching out to nonprofits, to the private sector, to educational institutions, to think about how they can provide technical assistance to communities. They actually have to apply to be an expert or a partner to provide technical assistance, and then you will have the chance to get technical assistance from them. And so we're really trying to build networks to assist in that grant application process. And the third, and this is what is personally very exciting to me, is collaborating on delivering projects themselves. What I think we really have an opportunity to do at DOT is not to say, all right, we gave you the money, we signed the grant agreement, we're done, good luck. That's not what we're here to do. Getting you money is only part of the equation. We really want to find ways to support you on completing and delivering the projects using the federal government's resources to address key project delivery challenges. That could mean streamlining, improving the environmental review process. That could mean making investments to expand domestic manufacturing. It could mean best practices on everything from change orders to utility relocation. It could mean convening stakeholders, mobilizing political community support for projects. We really want to figure out how we clear those roadblocks to project delivery, and we need a dialogue with you to make that happen. Yeah, thank you. Mike, you, you work for Kansas DOT. You have uh, next to the U.S. DOT, you are you are the you represent the big organization here in the room. You have all these direct relationships with folks here uh, in the building. Um, I think with so many new programs coming out of U.S. DOT and the complexity and the challenges we see on workforce, and and we talked a little bit about grant writing, and I know there's going to be a program tomorrow on that. But if you're a city and you are, or a local community, and you're interested in going after some federal dollars and need somewhere to turn and need some advice and some coordination or, or partnership, I think, I think a, a good question maybe for you might, might be what resources might KDOT have to, uh, to help support these localities as they look to um, try to identify programs and federal funds and, and maybe go after some of these in coordination or, or on their own with, uh, with the state. Right. And like we talked a little bit um, during my opening comments, uh, we're very interested in working with people and helping them be successful um, with their grant applications. Again, we're really encouraging this collaborative regional approach uh, with those applications. The different tools we'd like to pro provide, the different investigations we're looking into, particularly on the rail side. I'm, I don't know, I'm actually fairly excited about some of the conversations we've had about the data that's available, for example, with rail crossing, uh, block crossings. I'm, I'm extremely excited about that. I apologize. You may hear about it again here today because I'm not sure I can really stop talking about it. Uh, but no, I think those things are, are very significant. Um, Vanessa Lam Lam Lamoureux, our, uh, she kind of heads up our uh, bill and grants team here at KDOT. You know, she's a tremendous resource for locals who are interested in submitting these, these grants app, 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 app applications. I talked to her uh, be, before uh, today's session, and she's looking forward to folks re reaching out to her and, and finding out what those opportunities could, 
could look like. But I, I can't say enough in terms of this, um, this notion of collaboration on these projects. I think some of our most successful endeavors at KDOT have been uh, a partnership through and through, from soup to nuts, from the planning to the grant application to the execution of the project. In particular, I'm thinking about our Turner Diagonal project in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, that started off as uh, kind of an idea on a cocktail napkin, and some people got together and talked about it. Next thing we knew, uh, a grant application had been submitted uh, over the course of several years. Uh, that particular stretch of highway um, is administered by both KDOT and the KTA. That opened us up to some unique opportunities to deliver the project itself from a construction standpoint, so we capitalized on that. In addition to local government, MARC, KDOT, KTA, the private sector was engaged in the project as well. They contributed funding towards the effort. I think that's a really important example of a number of partners coming together uh, and executing something that seemed very unlikely, unrealistic from the outset. Uh, it's a fantastic project. Uh, it's, it's created jobs. It's really helped to begin to change the landscape in that area of KCK. So I, again, I can't underline this enough. Um, we're here. We want to partner. We want to be collaborative and helpful with these applications. Even if we're not able to apply, thinking of safe streets, we want to be there to be of assistance. So please keep us in mind. Please reach out to me or Vanessa for that assistance. Mentioned safe streets. That's a fantastic um, example. As a as a national firm, when we go around and talk to other DOTs, this is a prime um, program example that I like to share with DOTs about how they can help get their priorities through, even though they're not the lead applicant. Right. So DOTs are not cannot be the lead applicant for safe streets, but it requires them to then coordinate with all of the localities that that serve within that state. Um, to help coordinate and to help facilitate these projects. And it's such a great opportunity of, uh, of collaboration for states to work with um, local governments and local entities to help push the same safety priorities forward just through a different mechanism. But honestly, great, um, great program. Amanda, do you have um, comments regarding um, coordination and, and um, partnership, obviously, as, a, as an MPO? Um, that's kind of what you do. Yeah, I was going to um, say, so. got lots of comments on, yeah. on partnerships and collaboration. I mean, it, it truly is the bread and butter of what MPOs do. Um, our work is all about collaboration and coordination. And so um, we are here to serve, and by we, I mean, you know, Flint Hills, Topeka, Lawrence Douglas County, Wampo. We are not the only MPO in the state of Kansas. And uh, but we work with other MPOs across the country, including all of the state of Kansas and Missouri, to make sure that we're all working with best practices and that we're, you know, I mentioned this, the Federal Highway Peer Exchange earlier this week that was with other MPOs across the country. And one of the things that we were asked to do as one of the larger MPOs was reach out and invite some of our smaller MPO partners to join the conversation to make sure that smaller and rural communities have access to the same discussion and information sharing and best practices because we, we know that they have smaller staffs. They are responsible for a lot more stuff on, on individual plates. And so uh, we take our role very seriously as one of the larger MPOs to make sure that we are bringing in as many partners. We, are, we were a, a part of what was called the Heartland Civic Collaborative for a, a period of time, which is the um, transportation and, and utility and a bunch of other coordination, but it was multi-state. It was Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, um, Iowa, and Missouri, I think, were all possibly Northwest Arkansas. Um, but when we talk regional, we don't just mean, you know, Kansas City Metro. We get into larger regional. We understand that the transportation system is a system that expands outside of the Kansas City Metro, too. Kansas City is the second largest rail hub outside of Chicago. We have tons of goods movement, logistics, freight that is part of our local economy just as much as it is part of the regional economy. We understand that we need to make sure that what is happening in the Kansas City region is supportive of what happens in rural Kansas, in rural Missouri, in Iowa, Nebraska, the North south and east west states with i-70 coming through kansas city and i-35 coming through kansas city we have an i-29 ending into kansas city we have an awful lot of freight and logistics that come through that are part of our planning processes that are involved you know we have a goods movement committee at mark this is this is very much part of the discussion and so um, when we talk about the collaborations i mean we we don't do anything alone we do everything with as many people that will come to the table with us as possible so um you know i'm going to kick 
Mike under the table here because we are also competing for a raise grant. And so we can, you know, we're all waiting for, for those raise grant results. But the raise grant that we submitted as an MPO was the Sustainable Bi-State Corridor. So it stretches from Western Kansas City, Kansas to Eastern Independence along that Independence Avenue and State Avenue corridor. And it's all about sustainability and access and transportation and, and jobs. I mean, it's, it's all of those things. And that is, some, that is the kind of stuff that we do all the time. We don't do anything without coordination and partnership. Oh, thank you. Um, and of course, Matt, you mentioned, um, you mentioned um, workforce and I, I mean, this coordination is such an opportunity, I think, um, for folks before we get into uh, maybe some of the challenges we're seeing or maybe reiterating some of those challenges that, we've, that we can identify. But um, as an opportunity, how is it on the city level um, looking for coordination and partnership? Is it, uh, is it an opportunity? Is it a challenge? Is it both? Um, what, uh, what, do, what do you see there? Uh, <clears throat> both, I mean, kind of a chicken answer, but the, I, I think if you've got some experience in partnering that uh, uh, it's an opportunity to make that more robust and more meaningful. Um, if you don't have, you know, good interlocal government relations or you've got kind of uh, sort of uh, antagonistic relationships with private partners and those types of things, it's going to be, it's going to be hard work. You're going to be disadvantaged. Uh, so let's say time well spent right now uh, building, building those relationships and, uh, you know, if you don't feel like you can trust, try it, I guess, and, and let the success of a project kind of uh, validate that, uh, that well-placed trust. All right, I'd like to I'd like to do a little quick fire with you guys. Um, real quick, question is challenges. What do we see? We have this amazing historic opportunity. Florence did an awesome job of kind of laying out what that looks like from a federal partnership, federal perspective. Um, but obviously, we're here on a state level, and we're looking to take advantage of all of those dollars and all of that opportunity. So maybe I'll start with you, Matt, because. Um, you're representing a city directly who could use some of those funds, I yeah, have no doubt. absolutely. What do you think? Uh, I think it's an opportunity that matches, well, it's, it's, it, it's bigger. There's more commas and more zeros, uh, but it's similar to when Tiger first came out. Uh, our community was faced with losing passenger rail service, as was uh, uh, the western half of Kansas, uh, eastern Colorado, northeast New Mexico, uh, and we, uh, the Senate president at the time, Steve Morris, Kansas Senate President Steve Morris from southwest Kansas convened, he was concerned, convened Amtrak, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, who was the track owner, uh, and some representatives from city and county government in Colorado and city and county governments between the city of Newton and uh, uh, all, the, all the way to Garden City, uh, had a meeting, and, and let's define the problem, and it was determined then that there was a hundred million dollars plus of improvements that needed to be made. Actually, I think the initial number was 200 million, but that was ballparked, and we said, okay, let's design this, let's engineer this, let's like get hard numbers, and it came down to about a hundred million at the time. We, uh, we applied for, the city of Garden City applied for a Tiger Grant, um, horrible experience, and, administering an FRA grant but the it was it was way out of our capacity we could have used some state assistance and did get get did get a lot of it, state assistance but uh, we landed it it was like 25 million dollars uh, the you know that's great we just built a quarter of a car uh, and then but Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Amtrak agreed to allow the Southwest Chief to continue to operate uh, on the prospect that we might get another one. At that point in time, no project in America had received two Tiger Grants. Uh, you received funding once, and then you went to the, you went to the end of the line. Um, we received a second grant. Project name changed to whatever it was. What was the second version? Got a third one, got a fourth one, got a fifth one. Um, uh, three state departments of trans, well, initially two, uh, Kansas and Colorado. Um, that at the time were under two completely different uh, political party influences, uh, two congressional delegations, again, split between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, New Mexico uh, Department of Transportation came along and uh, uh, 
um, communities uh, all along that corridor. So, we, so we've done it, um, and we've got a history of doing it. I think the next big project sits out there for us, and to the extent we can have that match um, our priorities as a region, but also the state's priorities towards what does resilience look like, not just from a natural disaster standpoint, but from an economic disaster standpoint, doesn't it make sense to uh, more fully unlock the economic development potential of your state, uh, of our state, uh, and build resiliency through economic health? And I think the next big project, like the Southwest Chief uh, Rural Rail Partnership uh, that dominated the Tiger Grant funding category for 10 years on a national level, I think we have the chance to do that with highway dollars. That's great. Amanda, what, uh, you talked a little bit about this in your opening, um, opening remarks, but um, challenges. Real quickly, we have workforce, we've identified, we talked through maybe even some of the opportunities around that, but what other challenges do you see in making sure Kansas gets, uh, we'll call it its, its share of, uh, uh, of, of bill funding on a competitive level? Um, I think one of the big challenges that we have in planning, and this is one of those, again, across buckets, and they could be having this conversation in any of the other number of breakouts, is we are increasingly trying to do performance measures, data-driven decision-making, all of these things, and when you look at the source data, it's a mess. How do we have better data standards so we can start, so we can set ourselves up for 50 years of better improvements, better planning, better implementation, because we've, we've used this opportunity where there is specific dollars in to set up meaningful data systems that can live on into the future. When I say systems, I mean, you know, schemas for collection, things that, you know, it's not just buying a software platform that the company is going to get bought by Amazon in five years and it's going to change hands three times and it's going to, you know, like, we need to set ourselves up with those data sharing partnerships too so we have the relationships built so the local crash data feeds into the regional crash data which feeds up to the state system which feeds up to NHTSA. We want to do safety projects, and, and there, are, there are specific sections of crash data where like two categories in the same section could be overlapping. You could be talking about the same crash in two different categories of the same, the same incident. So how do we learn how to make the data more actionable, more useful, more regionalizable, more, and when I say region, you know, mega region, maybe the, the, so there's not so much work on the back end, to make that useful. We, we go through all of these iterations of different performance measures and what's required and what's not, and some are federal and some are state and some are local, and, and how do we make sure that we are, that they actually are meaningful and that we're, not only that, that we're actually using them for something. So when we were planning, I mentioned the AV framework already, but we've talked about in a lot of our different programs, you know, personally identifiable information and privacy and cybersecurity, you know, that's its own bucket here. All of these things are really, really important. So making sure that instead of being all about hungry, hungry, hippoing every piece of data we possibly can and then figuring out what to do with it later, be intentional about what data we need and how we're going to use it. And that provides a level of transparency to our residents too, that they're saying, okay, they have this data and that makes sense because they're using it for this. You don't have to have a use case for every single piece before it comes in, but trying to get everything and then making sense of it at the end is a lot harder than saying, okay, we wanna make this stuff better. Where do we start? Excellent point. I mean, I, I think when I, when I travel around the country and I talk to different states and localities about, about applying for grants, a lot of the time, um, what comes up is insufficient data to help support a narrative, to help support an application. That's obviously the last thing you want when a notice is out on the street and you have a deadline you're working up against. So I would tell you one of the first best practices we we advise folks, and maybe you'll hear about this tomorrow at the grant writing, is, is um, start before the notice comes out, understand the requirements under the program in advance, if, identify your project, and then start to identify the data sets you might need to tell your story correctly in advance so that you don't end up in a situation where you have an application due in 30 or 60 days and now you have to do a traffic study and you can't get that done in time. So um, there are, data is critically important. I'm sure Florence would share this when, when the department looks at these grant applications. Um, you, you, you should absolutely strive to have data to back up your narrative um, explanations. Mike, let me turn it over to you real quick. We're gonna, we're gonna turn it over for questions here momentarily, but, but Mike, what do you see as some challenges on the state level? So, Quick on challenges, um, we've talked a lot about the discretionary programs in Bill, the number of discretionary programs, 40%. And I, this is not a complaint. This is not a complaint. This is social commentary on reality. 
Those are two different things. But you look at the lifespan of a discretionary project. You have your, your pre-application process where people are getting their stuff together and talking about a project. You have your application process. You probably won't be successful the first time through. Then you have your reapplication process. And that can be more than once, right? Then on top of that, oh, I've been awarded. Now it's time for the project itself. So you complete the project. And you think, OK, we're all done. Well, you're not all done. You've got three years of reporting after the fact from there. So some of these discretionary projects can stretch, let's just say, 10 years, right? And that wasn't a problem when once or twice a year there'd be a NOFO for Tiger or maybe Infra. That's not a big deal. Now it's a year-round process. There's multiple di di discretionary programs out there across all the modes, Chrissy, Bridge Investment, Infra, Rays, et cetera. It's a tremendous, I'm not going to say burden, I would never say burden, but it's a tremendous undertaking um, for a state DOT because a lot of the funding flows through us. Even if Matt wins money as the applicant, it still flows through KDOT. There's still responsibility there. So there's just this, um, there's just a lot of effort that comes along with this. And I think for us, that's a challenge we're going to have to learn to grapple with. And then you factor in workforce and the, the realities we face there. Um, it's going to be challenging, but like I said earlier, Bill's a call to action, and we are up to the challenge. Lawrence, let me pose a challenge to you really quickly, a very specific one that I think um, the department um, has a lot of good information on. But, but information deficit can be a challenge for folks in cities, especially related to what these programs are, the opportunity, and when the opportunity is, is available. So if I'm representing a city or a county or a locality, and I want to know what what when are these programs going to be made available? How do where do I go? Where do I turn to, or who at the department can I turn to if I wanted to find out what programs and when we might see notices of funding, so I can help prepare in advance um, to to think about what project or what application I might want to consider submitting. Yeah, thanks for the question. So if you go to our uh, transportation.gov/bipartisan-infrastructure-law website. Um, our bill website, what we actually have there is a upcoming notices of opportunity calendar or notices of funding opportunity calendar. Um, the calendar was created by yours truly, by myself actually, <laughs> uh, because we had heard um, this very piece of feedback from many um, folks from many stakeholders that knowing even a, at a month level when those notices of funding opportunities coming out are so valuable to us. I, I'll be um, frank here, we don't have every single notice of funding opportunity on and some of the dates are apt to slide around a bit, but we are really at least trying to provide a frame work for when that funding is going to come. And so uh, we try to refresh that once every month or so. Um, we're due for another refresh very soon, and we've been doing updates you know, throughout this year. But that's our at least framework for where we think the major build notices of funding opportunities, the one that you're most concerned about, the biggest ones, the newest ones, um, that's where to go at least to see at a month level um, when they're coming out. Um, I, I want to also just respond to a couple Absolutely. things that folks have brought up. I think first, Sean, you said uh, the, state, the piece about try to put together your applications before the notice funding opportunity comes out. You may be wondering, how do I do that? I don't know what they want. Um, actually, you do. And, and the reason that you do is because what we are trying to do in all our notices of funding opportunities is incorporate standard language and standard selection criteria. Like you saw this morning on one of my slides, the fact that the administration cares about good jobs, resilience, equity, that isn't going to change. That's going to be part of every single notice of funding opportunity. And so if you can start thinking about now, how do I represent my project in that light? That's one way that you can take action at what, what Sean said in preparing your application before the notice of funding opportunity even comes out. And then the second thing what you said, Mike, yes, I'll be honest that not everyone will win the first time around. Um, and if you don't win, what we do for many of those programs is we offer debriefs where actually someone sits down with you from DOT one-on-one -on -one and talks to you about what you could have done better in your application. So take advantage of those. Let me reiterate that. Yeah. That is a, a bit of recommendation that I think you should take to heart because it's very, very challenging to win these federal dollars. There are many times oversubscribed. 
and on the off chance you aren't successful, um, the department is fantastic about walking you through some of the areas where you can improve your application and sometimes at very little cost to the organization so that in the next cycle you're much more competitive and much more likely to win. So um, I, would, I would reiterate what Florence said, that's a fantastic bit of advice. Um, and thank you for putting that calendar up because that calendar is um, amazing to have access to and uh, challenging, I'm sure, to put, um, put lanes around for you. At this point, we're gonna turn it over to the audience. So hopefully you guys have heard some interesting things, have some specific questions. Um, so at this point, I'd, if anyone has questions, raise your hand, we'll, we have a microphone, we'll walk it around and um, we'll make sure, um, make sure to raise those questions. Yeah, we have one over here. Uh, Rick Backlund, Federal Highway Administration. Actually, I wanted to possibly just add a little bit to what Florence was saying. In addition to these notices of funding opportunity <laughs> and, you know, the resources online, oftentimes what we will also have are webinars on how to apply, and those are key. For example, tomorrow we're having a webinar in the afternoon on reconnecting communities pilot. So there's tons of these webinars that we're trying to produce to help folks have a sense of when a NOFO comes out, what are the key things we're gonna look for? So just thought I might throw that in, thanks. Rick, if somebody in the audience wanted to attend your webinar, how did, where do they go for that information? Well, I'll say here in Kansas, <laughs> I feel like a plug here. Um, example, yesterday I've been regularly sending out these notices to Kansas Association of Counties, to the Kansas MPOs, to KDOT, to a lot of other folks. Uh, Florence talked this morning about DOT Navigator. That's an also that was just launched last week. That's a great resource. And then the Build website that she talked about from on transportation.gov. You know, it helps give you that advanced homework so you can be prepared. Awesome. Thank you. Other questions, please. Good afternoon. My name is Dana, and I am from a county of 3,500, Smith County. Um, it has some of the most, or has more bridges uh, per capita than a lot of other counties in the state. We have transportation needs, we have water system needs. Um, we can't get engineers to bid on our current projects. How do we get engineers to come help us on a proposal for any of these programs? Well, let's see, who do we, who do we have? I mean, I'd, Matt? Yeah. Sorry, Dana, I don't have the answer. I'd tell you what my strategy would be and then what my perspective is as a uh, as a city leader in a, in a in a larger community surrounded by uh, counties with less population. The uh, I think I think you've got to start the discussion with your neighboring counties who are likely in the same uh, same scenario and come together and and, and try to find a. Uh, critical mass. Uh, it, 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 look, the state of Kansas is interested in helping, you know, be a partner in that and facilitate that. I'm sure Mike can address that. Um, I'll obligate him though. The and if there's an area larger community, I really think for and granted, Garden City isn't that large, but by by a statewide comparison, but from a from a western half of the state standpoint, we are and we've got an obligation to. Uh, take care of, or to be thinking about water needs, highway needs, uh, housing needs, uh, not just in the counties surrounding us, but in the counties surrounding the counties that surround us, because they all come, uh, they all come and shop in our community, spend money. Some of them travel that far to work on a daily basis in our community. So I would, uh, I, I guess you could go visit with them, but if they're in this room, I would advocate for uh, them to step up and uh, maybe help facilitate that discussion and maybe partner partner in on a consulting engineer contract that, that they have and give you access to them. Mike, did you have something to add? Or? No, I was just going to say we should connect and, uh, and talk about that. You're, you're not alone in this. I mean, we see it at the state level, too, with some of our contracts, so I'd like, to, I'd like us to connect and maybe we can find something to, to move the path Perfect. forward. Next question. Hi there, Adam Timmerman with the KC Chamber of Commerce. Uh, just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on prioritization and collaboration on regional grant opportunities. Uh, for example, a Amanda and Mike, you guys both brought up, brought up your raised grant applications and we at the Chamber did letters of support for both of them. But what we saw in Kansas City 
uh, were five regional raise grant applications for five different projects with not a whole lot of communication between the five different um, projects. Unfortunately, when some of those projects too could have fit other grant opportunities, such as reconnecting communities or maybe going through the STIP process or going through potentially an earmark if those remain uh, through this year as well. So I guess my question is, are there, other, are there examples of encouraging collaboration in regional partnerships to align projects to the best grant opportunity that fits the spirit of the grant for that project versus everybody applying for the same grant hurting each other's chances for that region getting that grant or maybe a project that isn't the best fit for that grant getting that project would hurt the other applicants and their opportunities that's a great question and I'll tell you what I see in other states I see I do see examples where that coordination and that interaction from the state level and the locality happens and sometimes you have an infrastructure hub or you have an infrastructure advisory committee that's a state kind of coordinated entity where where these ideas and these applications can kind of feed into and discussion happens and I have seen examples where where a state has advised um, a local government to not apply directly um, help support the state's application and then they will use formula funds potentially to, to then support that project that then would have been competing and 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 then who knows how how successful um, that obviously helps align political support and uh, and advocacy community community support so there are benefits um, that you will see in certain areas around the country to, um, to to answer that kind of question but it's always challenging if you don't communicate with people and you don't tell them what you're doing that's what you get you end up in situations where you have um, a bunch of people people competing um, in the same general vicinity for, for those scarce federal resources. And I think Florence will be the first person to tell you uh, they do yeoman's work trying to use geographic diversity when they award grants all over the country. Um, but I would bet you're not going to see seven raised grants in one cycle in the state of Kansas, right? So your question is, is well put. I don't know if anyone had comment directly um, to that point, but I would think you know, the purpose of what we're doing here today provides a coordinating um, advocacy type interaction that then could be kind of expanded on when it comes to um, maybe broader support for a specific application. Other question? Good afternoon, my name is Rhonda Harris. I'm with the Kansas Department of Commerce and I work with the Office of Minority and Women Business Development. And my question is probably more related to what happens after a city or county is granted a, a grant or funding and they get they win a project and that project is uh, ready to go will the feds require any kind of um, goals on that project to contract with women and minority businesses to actually perform the work yeah, so, so I, the short answer there is yes, is that first of all, um, the uh, Federal Highways has requirements for each state Department of Transportation to meet uh, disadvantaged business utilization goals. Um, so that, that's been in place. And then because um, equitable procurement is a big priority for this administration, for the president, for the secretary, what we're really interested in understanding as well is seeing that, that projects are being ambitious about setting those goals and then reporting on those goals and meeting those goals. So uh, yes, that's something that we already have requirements in place for and that we're looking to see more of. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you imagine those goals will be adjusted due to the enormity of this project? So as I said this morning, um, we have already adjusted, adjusted our direct um, spend goal to 20% uh, of our spending going to smaller disadvantaged businesses by 2025. Um, in terms of setting aspirational goals for state and local governments like that that's not something that we have released publicly yet but that's something that we're really thinking about in terms of what is feasible and how we can work with our partners to create goals that are both achievable but also really push the envelope forward so we don't have something public yet but it's something we're having dialogue on every day is to figure out what is realistic okay and will that be published on your website if we do decide to make something public yes okay. mm -hmm. thank you so we have an online question uh, that's just come in um, related to your, your notice of funding calendar. So can you please um, provide the web address for that, for our folks who are online and in yes. the room there? 
Let me actually find it myself. <laughs> so give me one second. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have, um, while you're looking that up, we do have another question here in, in the room. Uh, just a mayor, Sling County. I've got a, a couple questions. Uh, first, I'm assuming that each funding category for the discretionary funds will have a standard contract. Um, is could is there a sample of these standard contracts that we could you know view even before we apply for the the con uh, apply for the funding uh, to see kind of what we're we're getting into. Um, and then second, I would like to know, you know, what, um, as far as for KDOT and discretionary funds, uh, I'm sorry, of the, of the um, formula funding, what communication has KDOT had with contractors and suppliers? Um, you know, how are we going to get all this work done? Um, you know, I'm just kind of curious of what their, their viewpoint is um, on this work, because I really do think that as, as far as for bridges, you know, in order to get this work done, we need to take a, you know, a six month long project and cut it down to three months, you know, and that means there's, there really needs to be a lot of advanced bridge construction techniques used, a lot of precast materials, which may be more expensive, but in the long run, um, it may be um, the better way to do it in order to get projects completed. All right, so two part question. Mike, I don't know if you want to address that. Yeah, so Second part the, first. The first part about the sample, uh, kind of a template contract. I think we can certainly work on that and um, and provide that if folks would like to see something like that. Regarding contractor capacity and KDOT conversations with the contractors, I know those have been taking place. Um, I can't speak to the nature of those conversations. I know that they're um, they're positive and productive. People feel like they can they can accomplish the uh, work, uh, but I have to get back to you with 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 more specifics on what those conversations are like. Those are two very good questions, though. Perfect. Hello, uh, my name is Gus Bernetti. I'm out of Crawford County. I have a question on the opposite end of a question posed earlier. Uh, we're kind of trying to establish ourselves more as a reliable funding, not source. Uh, is there a degree in which a project becomes too complicated and it hurts your prospects of getting funding for it? Because we're trying to package a bunch of cities together and their needs. Florence, I don't know if you can maybe direct or answer that question. Sure. So I think in, I'll say two things there. In terms of packaging projects together, I think that generally that is that can be helpful because if you're thinking about doing the projects together, you're saving on administrative costs, saving on contracting costs, streamlining, that's something that we think improves um, your chances of delivering those projects successfully. I think second, in terms of project complexity, again, it comes back to whether we think that you have the capacity and the readiness to deliver that project. Um, so I think if you're able to show that you put the thought in, you have a plan and you're ready to make adjustments to that plan as things change, which is inevitable, then I don't think that complexity should be a barrier to application. The other thing I'd say there is it's closed for this year, but the, the mega projects um, program, which is a $5 billion in guaranteed funding and the possibility of $10 billion more um, if Congress provides us appropriations, that is specifically for big complex projects that we think would have trouble getting done if we didn't have this new program. So I would encourage you to look at that as well. Um, and I know I owe an answer to the last question too. Yeah, I'll right? just add one point to, to what Florence just said. Um, a lot of the grant programs at USDOT have application um, limits. So sometimes complexity, if you can't tell your story within, you know, your your limited number of pages, um, that can be challenging too. And and I know we're all kind of working through these bridge nofos now around, around the country. And so, um, you know, when you talk about bundling many bridges under one application, they can get complex as it relates to BCAs and narratives and telling a story. So. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's n not a black or white answer, unfortunately. Sometimes it's just um, you have to be able to deliver the project and you have to be able to explain the project and, and then you know make sure the federal government feels good um, with your application and your ability to carry it out. Um, and so you have uh, a website for us. Yes, I have a website for you. So a web address. To build one, on one thing Sean said as well. There, there is the possibility if you bundle a lot of projects, we only fund some of them. That's just something that can happen, has happened before. So just you be ready that we might just fund, you know, two out of five or something like that could happen. Um, so the website is transportation.gov, the DOT website, as you know, uh, slash bipartisan-infrastructure-law slash, all right, here we go, 
um, upcoming dash notice dash funding dash opportunity dash announcements dash 2022. Now you know why I couldn't say it off the top of my head. Um, so I will talk to our web team about coming up with a better URL for that. So you got to find it without having to search. Um, but bipartisan infrastructure law, if you go to the just transportation.gov slash bipartisan dash infrastructure dash law should be on like the first page. Um, so I would really encourage you to look at that. And like I said, I will come up with a better URL, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And I'll get back to you guys on that. I don't know if there's a way to put that in the chat for the online folks, maybe. We can track it down and, and connect it through for people. Um, we have time for one more question. Anyone? Um... <laughs> Hi, uh, Curtis Mater, McPherson County. Um, for the uh, bridge inve in in investment program, there's a minimum of 2.5 million for that grant. Is that correct? Uh, that was on a webinar. Yes, uh, yes, that, so I, I think that's correct. I, I have a bridge that estimated at 2.5 million. Um, do you like to? S would you rather see, you know, a, a county go by itself? Okay, this is the minimum. I can do that. Or would you rather see? that growing to, let's say, five million with four projects instead of one. You know, so you're getting more projects in one grant, or is it just adva advanta advantageous just to do the one? I know, I know that's kind of very, spe very specific, but would you rather see, okay, McPherson County gets with Sling County, okay, just to get the grant bigger, or is it okay just to go by yourself and you don't have that collaboration, but it still needs done? I think either is fine, right? I think that either is an application that we'll, you know, take a close look at. I, I think one thing I will say is this, to be realistic, though. If you haven't ever gotten a federal grant before and you're putting in a funding for a $2.5 million um, application, the time and effort it's going to take to administer that is going to be substantial. And so if there's ways that you can partner with other entities, partner with the states to um, think through and um, take up, take off some of that, I will say burden, right, administrative burden, I think that that is a consideration that you, you want to um, probably be thinking about. Because like I said, we're happy to look at the individual projects, we're happy to look at the groups of projects, but just want to be make sure that you're ready to administer that. And it could be easier to do that if you're partnering with other entities. First of all, let me just say thank you again to the governor and the secretary um, and the infrastructure hub for hosting this panel today. Thank you to the audience and people online for listening and staying all the way till the end. Uh, and honestly, those amazing questions that get submitted, that is the whole purpose of this. And then um, honestly, the biggest thanks to the panel here for, for sitting up here and providing um, this amazing information. We will be here um, around, there's obviously another panel uh, discussion coming up uh, in a few minutes. Happy to answer questions outside of this, but let's give our panel uh, a round of applause. Please, thank you. And we are done.